Welcome to the Land Geek Podcast, your resource for information and tips to making money by buying and selling land. Let the Land Geek show you how to make a passive income by working smart, not working hard. Learn strategies and tricks to make money buying and selling raw land today. And here is the man that's going to help you do that, the Land Geek. Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the land geek from your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And today is really special because it's not often that I get a guy who has been investing in single family homes since 2009 while working full time at a New York City advertising agency. Then he made the switch to apartments when he realized he could achieve his financial goals a lot faster by buying lots of homes at once. And then he started fearless investing in February of 2013 and closed on a 168-unit apartment community worth over $6.7 million in July of 2013, where he formed a syndicate and raised over $1.3 million. He is the host of the ever-popular Best Real Estate Investing Advice Ever podcast. He is young, and I'm jealous, but he's very impressive. Joe Fearless from JoeFearless.com. How are you, buddy? Oh, well, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm doing extremely well. I'm so happy to be on the show. Uh, I love the name, The Land Geek. It's great branding from a former advertising guy, myself. Uh, and thank you so much, Mark. And I'm excited to speak with you and share um, a conversation with all your listeners. Yeah, that's great. And Joe, and Joe, so just to be clear, like you're not just a full time investor. You're also you you consult beginning investors, correct? Who want to specialize in buying apartment communities and raising money from investors. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, I, I work with uh, people who want to learn how to raise money and buy multifamily uh, communities. Why, Joe? Why not land? Why multifamily? Tell me, tell me your story. Like, you're you're this, you know, you're 32, right? I am 32 years old. Yeah, you're you're way too young to be doing. What you're doing. <laughs> well, age age is a real always relative, though, right? If we were talking to a 27 year old, he'd be like, "Wow, 32. That's way old." No, I know, I know. It's great. I mean, you're you're my hero. So, all right, so <laughs> okay. So tell me, like, you're at this full. You're you're like a big hitter in this New York City advertising agency. Yep. Um, what made you want to get into real estate? So just tell me a little bit about your background, your story. And um, then I honestly, I'm really going to try to put the jealousy aside, okay, <laughs> and just and just talk to you respectfully from now okay. on. All right. But if I don't, but if I don't, just don't get mad at me, okay? Hey, if there's a hint of jealousy, I'm going to take that as a compliment, right? Yeah. So I I, I will just soak it in. I like the um, reframing. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Yeah. Um, it, my my story is really really straightforward. Um, I was I moved from Texas, where I'm from. I'm, I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas. Went to school in Texas at Texas Tech. Moved straight from Texas to New York City to work in advertising because I wanted to be where uh, in my uh, mind the best of the best were competing in advertising. Climbed the corporate ladder really quickly in advertising. I was uh, the youngest vice president of a New York City ad agency. Um, before my 30th birthday. Wow. Uh, and then I realized uh, along the way uh, that I needed to learn how the heck to invest a dollar whenever I had a dollar to invest. Um, for anybody who knows the advertising or marketing, marketing industry, uh, you know that you don't make any money when you get started. Like literally – uh, you probably make less than minimum wage whenever you factor in all the hours that you work. And I didn't have any money initially. Uh, literally, I had no money in my savings account initially. In fact, I think I had like $100, $200 in credit card debt uh, from college that carried over. And so investing wasn't a big thing for me because I didn't have any money to invest. Once I started climbing the ladder, I was like, okay, I have $1,000 and it was $1,000. And I didn't know what to do with it. So I went to my bank. I saw that they had a CD certificate of deposit. Right. And I was like, well, what is this? And I did <laughs> a little bit of research on it based on the limited knowledge that I had at the time. And it, it was more money than I was making in my savings account. I put my money 
into it. They held it hostage for 12 very, very, very long months. I remember getting a check back for like $18 after a year. And I was like, oh my gosh, there (laughs) has got to be a better way. Uh, And then uh, I got taxed on that $18. (laughs) 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 This isn't going to happen again. I need to figure it out quickly. I read the book Investing for Dummies. It's a great book. It lays out all the different – well, the three different types of investing, stocks, bonds, real estate, and LLCs. Right. I then gravitated towards real estate, read a whole lot. I read at least a book a month, usually two or three. What, what a month. was it about real estate that, you know, attracted you versus stocks and bonds? I mean, you're in New York City, so yeah. you would think, oh, you know, you yeah, want, you want right. Hit- I mean, I, I literally yeah. live like what a ten minute walk from the stock exchange. Um, it was probably rich dad poor dad, to to be honest. Okay, yeah, a lot. I mean, people love that book. Yeah, yeah, it, it it made it seem so attainable, um, and they focus a lot on, on psychology in the book, less specifics. Uh, right. But that's what I needed at the time to push me in one direction. And then I started getting more information from different books that had more substance on the specifics of how to make it happen. Uh, that combined with my family background, my sister's a real estate agent, my dad used to be a real estate agent. Um, and it was just something that I uh, was already familiar with. Great, great. Okay, so you've got some money. You're working full time. Then what? Like, how did you carve out time to even start buying single family homes? Well, I, I think we can carve out whatever time we want. It's based on how we how we prioritize things. Um, I'm a firm believer of that. It's just a matter of. What we prioritize, I think it's what. Anytime someone says I didn't have time to do something, that is BS. Mm-hmm. They did have time to do something. They just didn't prioritize it uh, above other things that they did do. Right. And uh, that's what I did. I prioritized investing as a top priority for me. Uh, and at the time, it was right underneath my full time job. And then as I became less and less interested in doing working at an advertising agency, it started to creep up and gain uh, traction on the number one priority slot in my life. And uh, what I was doing is I was investing in Dallas-Fort Worth. In 2009, I bought my first single-family home. And and the market's just... You know, it's been wrecked at this point, correct? I mean, you're just buying it, things. It was the it was the perfect time to bar, buy. bargain basically. Yeah, pricing. And and I would love to have you know claim that I had the foresight and to uh, wait till the crash was over and then uh, save up my money and buy. But quite frankly, I didn't have the money to buy a home until 2009, and it just coincidentally I lucked out. And by the way, I happen to be from. Dallas Fort Worth, a market as I'm sure you would agree, is a very solid, fundamentally sound market. Joe, I love Texas. I yeah, love, I love all those. I love every market in Texas. Texas is great. Yeah, people love Texas. People love to, and hopefully, people love Texans too. <laughs> well, you know, if they don't, they do now. There you go. If we there just, you, go. you know, we'll just have you as a stereotypical Texan. There you go. And not all people who live in New York are mean. In fact, most people aren't mean. By the way, it's just uh, people are very. Straightforward, more straightforward in New York than other places. Do you, you, you know what? It's funny you say that. Do you like that approach better in business than sort of the the softer approach? Maybe you know, which is would be more charismatic way, like the Texas way is you know kind of just more charismatic, kind of more fun, um, you know. Versus yeah, I, you know, I, I think th- this is I my think, this is my price, Joe. Take it or leave it. <laughs> Well, I think there are two – in my mind, there might be two different things. Uh, first is in in the south, in particular Texas, there are certain social conventions that people adhere to. Uh, one of them is being polite for the sake of being polite, right. whereas in New York City, that's not the case. Um, I actually prefer the New York City approach because when somebody is – having a good conversation with me and we're hitting it off, I know it's legit. I know yeah. that we're actually connecting on a human level versus uh, the social conventions being in place in the South, and you're not quite sure if they're being polite for being polite's sake or if it's if it's real. Now, from the other angle that you mentioned, 
um, this is the price, take it or leave it. Uh, I mean, that just that could be really in any market. Um, I think at the end of the day, what I always, how I always approach that is, uh, I my favorite book is Crucial Conversations. I, you know, I just and, read that book. I love. Oh that my book. gosh! Great and they book. Talk, they talk about the mutual purpose, right? Right. Exactly. And that that's the I've read that book like five times. I've I give it to my clients to read. It's like you that it's the fundamentals of connecting with people uh, when the stakes are high and opinions vary. And um, they talk about uh, how you identify what's the mutual purpose. How can we both? What are we both trying to accomplish? And then building the conversation from that point forward. Exactly. Um, exactly. So that's and, yeah. I, and I love the so. fact that you know you realize going in. That they have a story too, and you may not know it all. You know what I mean. Even though you're assuming yep. something, you're creating a story in your mind, and they they kind of say, you know, let's just keep to the facts. They, you know, this is the way I see it factually. How do you see it? Exactly. Yeah, I love that part. Yep. Yeah, it's a great book. Okay, I'm sorry to to jump in on there. Okay, so, um, all right, so you're going into you're buying houses, 2009, and I assume you're you're flipping, and then when did the light bulb go off for you to say, "Well, I could probably do a little bit better if I bought a 168 unit apartment community." Yeah, well, uh, real quick on yeah. the homes, I'm a, I was actually buying and holding. You're, okay, you're uh, buying and holding, so you yeah, have tenants. yeah, because you know I live in New York City and I'm buying in Texas. Uh, it's it was would have been challenging. I actually tried initially to do some wholesaling and flipping. Uh, and I failed miserably uh, for because I, I just didn't have the the time that I chose to dedicate. I didn't prioritize it enough in my life to be successful at it. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend anybody try to flip homes living you know a couple thousand miles away from the the property unless they have a a great system in place, and that is completely out of my area of expertise. Right. Uh, so I, I was buying and holding homes. Uh, I was the first one I bought was a 20% down payment. The second one I bought was a 10% down payment via Home Path Loan Program, which I heard is going away. The third is uh, I paid all cash, but then I did a cash out refinance and got all my money back in my pocket. Great. And then the fourth I did a bought it with a personal line of credit, so zero zero dollars out of pocket um, at the time. Uh, so as far as the light bulb going off, it was a combination. It was a cumulative effect, really, of me looking at my career in advertising, me listening to a lot of Tony Robbins uh-huh. and how he talks about the human needs and he talks about the six human needs. I won't go into them but he says the final two lead to fulfillment and those two are contribution and growth or progress. Right. And you're fulfilled if you are contributing to something greater than yourself and you are growing mentally, emotionally – I wasn't – I didn't feel like I was contributing to anything larger than myself and I didn't care to grow mentally or emotionally within that industry anymore. Um, so as a result of that, I left the the agency world sure. and then after, as a result of leaving the agency world, I don't have a W-2 so I can't get approved to buy anything else by myself. Uh, OK. So I had to get creative and figure out, OK, what the heck? How do I do this? Uh, well, I can leverage other people's full-time jobs and uh, come up with a valuable opportunity for them to invest in, and um, then I can manage the process and uh, oversee it and, and be investors with them. And that's that's the drive behind it. I had studied started studying multifamily about three months in October of the year that I quit, and I quit in December, so October, November. So, so yeah, three months prior to leaving, and then um, I closed on the 168 units uh, in July of the following year, so July, August. Uh, so about nine months from when I opened the first book, a multifamily, to raising 1.3 and closing on 168 units. Great, great. So give us some insight. Like, What did you learn from that transaction? What were some of the you know the barriers. What was what was the hard part of it, and um, where are you with it today? The hard part was every part. <laughs> it was. It's a, uh, that's quite a learning curve. 
Yeah, it, it's it's quite the learning curve, my friend. <laughs> yeah, but you know, um, better better to learn while doing than just you know, because I I see so many people just have uh, paralysis by analysis, and you know they're just running spreadsheet models all day, and they never go out and make an offer. Yeah, that's not me. Yeah. Yeah, that's not my mentality at all. Um, as as evidenced by the the approach and. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. Um, it is better to learn by do, by doing. Um, the important part in that philosophy is to have people on your side who have been there, done that, uh, and mitigate the risk for you and your investors as much as possible. Um, as far as you know, specifically some of the hard parts and how I overcame them. One is I'd never raised a penny before. And right. <laughs> and so that that's a learning curve in and of itself. I wasn't in sales in advertising. I was in strategy and account service. So I was working with in, uh, with current clients uh, and helping grow the business. But I wasn't going in on the you know new business uh, pitches. Right. So it was it was a, a different skill set that I had to hone. Um, one of the tactical ways for anybody looking to raise money for a land deal or for any deal. Um, that I use that could be helpful is I identified all the different networks that I'm a part of from, you know, I'm on the alumni advisory board at Texas Tech. So people I know there, I'm on a flag football team. Um, people I know from fi- my flag football team, people I know from high school, from college, uh, and advertising people who I know who live in Midland, Texas. Right. So, so you oil. so you leveraged the one commodity that we all want to have with our community, which is trust. Absolutely. Trust. Even even though you didn't have a track record, you had some track it, record. Exactly. I had I had some track record, and um, it, it would have been a lot easier to transition from a, a residential real estate agent into deal syndication for multifamily. Right. And uh, I didn't. Um, <laughs> I was in advertising. <laughs> right. I was in advertising, um, and that's why you know some people. Uh, I have a call later today with someone who um, is interested in the, my program, and um, you know I, he mentioned in his first email. He's like, "Well, I, I've got. Uh, I don't have the experience, but I'm a, a residential real estate agent, and I'm thinking, wow, when we talk." We're gonna, we're gonna, sh- I'm gonna show you how much more experience you have than I had going into this. Um, so yeah, I leveraged the trust and credibility factor, and then combine that with the uh, the insane amount of knowledge I had about the the deal, right? And surrounding myself with team members who have a lot of experience, because as you mentioned at the very beginning of our conversation. Yeah, I'm relatively young. Um, obviously, it's relative to any, whoever you're talking to, but uh, especially in the industry too. It's not like I'm 32 and I've been in commercial real estate for 15, you know, 10 years after I graduated college or after I was, came out of high school. Uh, so I have to surround myself with people who um, have successfully done it um, at the time. And how I did that was I identified a property management company that had – Many units under management. I had a consultant who had closed on a lot of properties, and uh, with the team in place, I put together a nice little bio sheet. Uh, whenever I, we made offers, and collectively, we're pretty darn strong. Right, um, right. So, so now, did you have a blind a fund on your syndicate, no. or did you did you find this deal first and then go went out and raised money? Found the deal first okay. and went out and raised money, but uh, the caveat. I'll say two things. One is I started having initial conversations with investors about a hypothetical deal okay. just to start transitioning their the perception of me to them um, because at the, the time I was an advertising agency guy, uh, so I had to shift that trans, the, the perception to a multifamily person. That way once I had the deal – it would be a much shorter and uh, easier segue. Uh, and then secondly, I would say uh, never do uh, – never find a deal without having money lined up <laughs> verbally because right. it was a, a very stressful time. And um, you know, I, 
and putting stress aside, it's just from a business standpoint, it doesn't make sense. Right. Uh, because there's there's ways to raise the money verbally prior to having the deal locked in. Uh, granted, it's a verbal commitment, so anything can happen. But at least starting the process and getting uh, people saying yes, I'm interested. Uh, once once we the syndicator identifies what their financial goals are, we say. If I find something that meets your financial goals, would you like me to share it with you? Boom. Of course they're going to say yes. Right, and, right. And, and then you share it with them and um, you always want to raise at least 20, 30 percent more than what you think you need uh, verbally. Uh, and then um, then when push comes to shove, when people are wire, you know, transferring money via wire transfer to an escrow account, uh, you'll have some people drop off just because of life circumstances. And uh, you'll still come out ahead. I actually had someone, uh, two people, drop out about two weeks prior to when we were supposed to close, and I had to close, uh, make up a two hundred fifty thousand dollar gap. How'd and you do it? I I cried a little bit first. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you, and, you went into fetal position. Uh, I, I I would like to say uh, that I'm just being facetious, but no, I think there was some literal tears happening <laughs> at the time. Um, and what I did is I, I, I knew it was going to happen. Uh, I just kept pushing. I reached out to my existing investors and I reached out to other people. Uh, I was scrambling what I had under my assets and trying to figure out getting like personal loans and liens on my homes and all sorts of stuff. What ended up happening is an, an existing investor, uh, took the remaining $250,000. Right. You know, it's funny because I'm always telling my coaching students, the hard part of real estate is getting the deal. You get a deal, yes. you'll find the money. The money is usually not as difficult as what we all make it out to be. It's getting the deal. 100% agree. Yeah. Yeah. And so being relatively new to all this, and yeah. let's face it, forming a syndication is not something that is for the faint of heart. I mean, you've got to get, you know, a real estate attorney to draw up docs, right? And you know, there's laws in place about how you do this in a circular. Did you did you do a reg D? But you were over one point one over a million. So how did that work? We did a, an operating agreement um, and I did not do a PPM. Okay. Uh, I should have. Okay. And uh, but I didn't. Okay. And so uh, in the future, I will, and in, I might actually go back and do a PPM with the existing investors, even though things are going well, um, just to put it on the books. Sure. Uh, but that's something that uh, I, I found out now. Um, I found some, some resources now where you can actually get them for about $5,000. Oh, wow. Uh, through, yeah, crazy, crazy and expensive uh, through some, some resources. So um, there, there's ways to do it. Uh, you know, you typically you hear people say PPMs cost fifteen twenty k. Fifteen twenty k all day long, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I didn't have that money uh, at the time to to do it, so uh, I I put personal risk on the line um, because if something were to go wrong and an investor were to come back and say, hey, uh, I wasn't properly disclosed, right? Then it's it's on me. I um, mean that's personal liability on my side, uh, so that's why I, n I never do what I did on my first deal from a, a PPM standpoint. Um, always get the PPM and work with an attorney and and make sure it's buttoned up. Sure, sure. Okay, so um, so the whole thing was just hard and arduous. So from starting, from finding the deal, getting the money, how long did it take to close that deal? One month longer than it was supposed to uh, okay. because <laughs> um, what happened, we, we got it with a master lease with option to purchase. Okay. So we, we – then that's a whole other story and we, we probably don't have time to get into it. But um, essentially we financed it creatively because there was a large prepayment penalty on the property. Therefore, in order to not trigger their prepayment penalty – we implemented the strategy of uh, doing a master lease. Um, so we had one month delayed closing 
uh, because I saw in the lender documents that the our, the our seller had with their lender that they there was not a master lease allowed to be on a property on the property right. uh, without written approval. So we waited a month to wait for the lender to give my group written approval that we could do the master lease because I was not about to raise 1.3 million dollars and a lender to say, you know, not only is this due on sale uh, right now because it's technically you just sold the property without receiving payment, uh, but this is an invalid agreement in the first place. So uh, you're going to have to try and get your 1.3 million dollars back from the the seller because we're totally out of this. Right. Uh, so uh, to answer your question directly, it took about from June to August, uh, actually June to July. Uh, two months uh, under contract because we had been working on the property for a couple months prior to putting it under contract because it was through a relationship. I see. Okay. All right. Great. Great. And then uh, was it hard sourcing that deal? Did you get it from a broker? Were you, you were out just making offers? Was it you know a bank? I actually got it through a consultant that I was working with and he was helping teach me the business and um, he was connected to a lot of people, and he came across this opportunity uh, and the unique nature of it. Uh, this property that I have, it was on LoopNet, believe it or not. Uh, but the because of the large, they call it the feasance penalty, prepayment penalty, same thing. Right. Because of the prepayment penalty, nobody was touching it because uh, it didn't make sense to put new financing on it, right. even with the even with the attractive uh, debt options that are available. Uh, so we came in from an angle that nobody else was coming in from and made it made it work for everybody involved. Very creative, Joe. Very creative. Well, thank you, Mark. So, you know, I know we don't have much time, but how important is the marketing background that you have? Because, you know, we were talking about it and we were joking about it, you know, before the podcast. You know, your podcast is called Best Real Estate Investing Advice Ever. Mine's a land geek. Who, who, <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it's it just goes to show you, like, marketing is so important in, in in every aspect, right? So can you just, you know, talk a little bit about how that's transitioned into your real estate? It's, it's throughout everything that I do, my yeah. marketing background, my advertising experience. It is – the foundational elements that's driven me to the point where I'm at right now. Um, it's allowed me to um, get press prior to ever closing on a multifamily property but being written about in Yahoo Finance um, about a deal that I was working on. I, I, was, I was quoted uh, by a reporter uh, and in fact one of my investors – uh, got an email from Yahoo in his inbox uh, whenever we were looking at the, whenever I was looking at the deal. I didn't even talk to investors yet. He's like, "Oh my gosh, I got this email. Um, tell me about this deal." Well, he ended up investing with me. Right? Um, yeah. There you go. It, it's 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 insane. So it's positioning yourself so that um, the first and foremost, you know who you are and what you represent. And once you know who you are and what you represent, then it's a matter of finding the most effective outlets of of doing that. And the from a from a marketing standpoint, I mean, if you're an investor and I'm speaking to you, then it's extremely relevant that I was in advertising and I know marketing because ultimately we're buying a business and right. the income for the business is rent, and you get rent from having the place. Full, <laughs> right? You, you get you have the place full by having people stay there. So you have resident retention programs, um, and you advertise it effectively and within the community because most of your renters are going to be uh, within a one to three mile radius of the actual apartment community. They're going to be the, the, it's a very close uh, area for uh, where you're going to be renting people from or right. where people are going to be renting from. Um, one thing. Uh, specifically that I've done with resident retention for the 168 unit that is a bit unique. Um, I, I actually haven't mentioned this on a, another 
a show before, so exclusive stuff for you and your your awesome listeners. Great. Um, we give the residents uh, for everybody who has paid on time for that month and has a zero dollar balance. We mail them a thank you letter. You know what? What are stamps now? I don't even know. There, it's under fifty 40, cents. Forty cent, forty four cents. Forty cent. Yeah, yeah, under under fifty cents. Uh, plus, we buy them a dollar scratch off ticket. Wow, and I love that idea. The per the perception of a dollar scratch off is much greater than a dollar. Yeah, absolutely. and they are just blown away by it every month. And you know, I'm in uh, an area. This apartment community is in an area. It's you know, working class, uh, hardworking people. Um, so the opportunity to make money every month by simply paying their rent on time just is is an incredible incentive and they're incredibly grateful and we have really good retention just from that one program that costs a dollar fifty plus a little bit of time to have a, t- a template um, to create at the beginning where you just write the letter and that's it you mail it out it's an it's an amazing program and that's the type of stuff with my projects and I tell my investors I bring to the table yes the fundamentals are obviously going to be there but then there's a little bit something extra and that's what differentiates me I love it I love it all right Joe well this is the time in the Land Geek podcast I get to put you on the spot and ask for your tip of the week it can be a quote, a book, a resource where we talked about uh, crucial conversations, but um, whatever you want, what, what's your tip of the week? Model after those who have successfully done what you want to do. Model after those who have successfully done what you want to do. So basically find yourself a good mentor. Find yourself a good mentor men- and not only that, but identify and be a student of the competition and their business model. Once you understand the competition's business model and you get as much material from them as you can from a you know I, I, from marketing terms, secondary and primary research, secondary research where you scrape the internet and primary research where you you know try and identify um, things that you can you can actually do whether you speak to current customers of theirs or whatever um, I am a huge student of identifying a business that I want to be in in this case multifamily and seeing what the best of the best are doing getting on their webinars getting on their email lists uh, requesting information speaking to the people there and understanding their business that way I can take bits and pieces of their business and apply it to mine and add my special sauce I love it I love it well Joe I really appreciate you taking your valuable time to be on the podcast today and my tip of the week is to learn more about the incredibly dynamic and successful Joe Fairless Go to JoeFairless.com. I have a link to it in the uh, in in the show notes, but it's Joe J O E Fair as in I'm being fair to you. Less L E S S dot com. Um, so do that. I also have another tip because Joe's. Let's. I guess we can all agree Joe's kind of a marketing genius. Um, it's called PageYourself.com. Joe, have you heard about this? Site, page yourself. I haven't, but I need to hear about it if you're recommending it. What is it? Well, you know, it's for those people that aren't very techie. And can we all agree that Facebook might be a good place to market? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, it basically allows you to create your own Facebook page without having to know design or anything like that and help you run promotions and quizzes and fan gates and all types of cool stuff um, for your business so check it out it's you can start for free and then I think that you know it's like a the freemium model but it's pageyourself.com and you know as Joe would agree you you, you always have to be trying new marketing techniques and, um, and seeing what works for you so um, Joe Fairless are we good I'm good thank you, you so much Mark Thanks, Joe. Are you going to come back and do this again? It, hey, if, if you invite me back, I'd, I'd be more than happy to come back and have another conversation. 
I love it. I love it. Well, thanks so much. I want to thank everyone for listening. And uh, if you would, take two minutes out and just rate the podcast. Go on iTunes. Let us know how we're doing. And, um, you know, we would really, really appreciate it. We need the feedback. And, uh, and that's going to help us so much. And I'd really appreciate it. And look, if you're looking for some wholesale land, go to FrontierPropertiesUSA.com. Um, invest there. And if you want to learn more about how you can make an incredible income actively and passively buying and selling raw land, go to www.thelandgeek.com and download for free the Passive Income Blueprint. Get the ebook, How to Avoid the Three Fatal Land Buying Mistakes. And of course, get this always informative and engaging podcast delivered each week to your email inbox. This is Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek. Show Fairless, thanks so much. And we'll see everybody next week. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Land Geek. Join us next time for more tips, secrets, and information that will help you succeed. Stay connected with The Land Geek on Facebook at facebook.com slash thelandgeek.